Okay, so now I'm going to annotate chapter five of Jekyll and Hyde, the incident of the letter. So uh, obviously letters are going to be really, really important in this chapter. So it was late in the afternoon when Mr. Utterson found his way to Dr. Jekyll's door, where he was at once admitted by Paul, remember the butler, and carried down by the kitchen officers and across a yard which had once been a garden to the building which was indifferently known as a laboratory or the dissecting rooms. I think it's important to note that he's got a laboratory in his house and he's got some dissecting rooms. Now, these would be to kind of, this is to do with anatomy and to do with kind of like, almost like autopsies, that perhaps these rooms are not used for any more, but once upon a time, they were used for um, uh, for kind of cutting apart dead bodies and sort of investigating the anatomy of the human body. Uh, and obviously he's got a laboratory there as well. So just notice just how big this house is. We, we're going to watch a video actually after this that will explain a little bit more about, the, uh, about Jekyll's house. The doctor had bought the house from the heirs of a celebrated surgeon. I just want to underline that. This is going to be someone called, well, we can, we can guess that it's someone called John Hunter. And again, we're going to watch a YouTube video that explains a little bit more about John Hunter after um, I've annotated this uh, chapter. And his own taste being rather chemical than anatom anatomical. So this, you know, there was a question on this on the quiz that, you know, Jekyll is actually a man of chemistry rather than anatomy. So he's more interested in kind of the bonding of chemicals rather than the anatomy of the human body. Had changed the destination of the block at the bottom of the garden. It was the first time the lawyer had been received in that part of his friend's quarters, and he eyed the dingy windowless structure with curiosity. So this part of um, Jekyll's house is dingy, it's windowless, you can't see into it, and he's curious about it. There's that word curiosity, a key theme again. And gazed around with a distasteful sense of strangeness as he crossed the theatre. So it's distasteful, um, there's a sense of strangeness, as he's crossing this this theatre, remember it's an operating theatre, not a uh, not a um, not a kind of performing theatre. Once crowded with eager students, and now lying gaunt and silent, a kind of um, kind of personification there of the room that is so silent. It's it's kind of eerily quiet. The tables laden with chemical apparatus, the floor strewn with crates and littered with packing straw, and the light falling dimly through the foggy. Uh, uh, cupula. So just notice this, even the way he's describing this laboratory, um, Utterson's getting, kind of getting a new look into this house. Again, dingy, I think it's, an, it's, a, it's, it's a good word to use, that um, this, it was used to describe kind of Hyde's apartments earlier, and now it's describing Jekyll's uh, laboratory. At the further end, a, light, a flight of stairs mounted to a door covered with red bays. So we get another door, and this time it's covered with red bays. Bays is kind of like the material that you get on kind of a uh, on a snooker uh, table or a pool table. You know, often that would be green bays. Here it's sort of a red bays. So they've got this strange door, and just like the door from the first chapter, you know, the story of the door. Um, doors equal secrets. You know, there's a big sort of theme of secrecy in this book. And here's this strange red door. It's also very, very, um, it's kind of a classic Gothic fiction. And here's a word for you, trope. And a trope is kind of uh, a convention we see in a certain type of literature or a certain genre of film or something. But at least this kind of red door is a classic sort of image from kind of Gothic literature. And through this, Mr. Utterson was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. Now, a cabinet is not a cabinet like we think of today. A cabinet's a bit more, think of it, if you will, a bit like a little office or something, rather than being like, you know, he's not getting in a wardrobe. It was a large room fitted round with glass presses, furnished, among other things, with a cheval glass and a business table, and looking out upon the court by three dusty windows barred with iron. So I think this is interesting, isn't it? That the, the windows are barred with iron, a little bit like a prison. It's quite intimidating, this place. Um, and, and obviously he's got these strange, these scientific things in there, these glass presses, this cheval glass. This is gonna be important later on, so I'm just gonna underline that now, because later on, we might learn a bit more about some of this stuff. The fire burned in the grate. A lamp was set, lighted on the chimney shelf. 
for even in the houses of uh, for even in the houses the fog began to lie thickly now we've ha- we've already had this idea of fog in london now remember london at the time in victorian london was notoriously foggy it was even known as the pea super and it was called that because people would um sort of wander through the fog and they would end up you know falling into the river thames by accident and they were called it was called a pea super because well their heads bobbing in the water were like peas so so london a really foggy place and stevens is using fog uh, constantly as a kind of uh, as pathetic fallacy really for how mysterious things are but even in this house there is fog even inside the even in even inside this house it's lying thickly as well there's a thick fog inside the house uh, and that's obviously um, again hinting at kind of a mystery I'm going to put that in there sort of mystery that is lies within this laboratory, this strange laboratory that Utterson has entered. And there, close up to the warmth, sat Dr. Jekyll, looking deadly sick. Okay, a key quote there. He, last time we met him, he was at ease. He was a jolly old soul. This time, he is deadly sick. Sorry, it's a little bit blurry there. I'm not sure what that is. Um, he did not rise to meet his visitor, but held out a cold hand and bade him welcome in a changed voice. So let's note the cold hand. That's interesting. And also this changed voice. He's not the same. Something has happened, but we don't know at this point. We don't know what's happened. We might find out later what happens to him. And now, said Mr. Utterson, as soon as Paul had left them, you have heard the news. The doctor shuddered. They were crying it in the square, he said. I heard them in my dining room. So this is the murder of Carew. And clearly, it's it's made a big impact on the public. It's like public outcry at the murder of this great MP Danvers Carew. One word, said the lawyer. Carew was my client, but so are you. And I want to know what I am doing. You've not been mad enough to hide this fellow. So that's... Um, Utterson's first kind of instinct is, are you, Jekyll, are you hiding? Hide. You know, he's a murderer. You can't be crazy enough to do that. Utterson, I swear to God, cried the doctor. I swear to God. Let's notice that repetition. Remember, swearing is like promising. I promise to God. And he's, this word, he cries. So he's very distressed by this murder. Very distressed. And he's crying out. I will move over here. This might take a bit of ingenuity for me to move it over. Uh, okay yep i will never set eyes on him again again he's sort of promising i will never even look at him again yeah it's like a promise question mark i bind my honor to you that i am done with him in this world interesting bit of that phrase is you know um it's gonna try and just yeah okay um that i'm done with him in this world in this world is the interesting quote there what does he mean by that you know, like I'm done with him in this world, but not done with him in an, in another world. And what other worlds could there be? Well, heaven, hell. What's that about? A bit strange. It was all at an end. And indeed, he does not want my help. You do not know him as I do. He is safe. He is quite safe. Mark my words. He will never more be heard of. OK, so Jekyll says that he's safe. Don't worry about him. He's kind of trying to reassure um, reassure Utterson that it's all at an end. Now, obviously, this is chapter five, so it's not at an end. Um, and I think this is a, you know, he's been a bit optimistic here. The lawyer listened gloomily. Doesn't like this. There's another adverb, gloomily. Summing up how um, Utterson's feeling. He did not like his friend's feverish manner. Yes, yeah, so, so Jekyll's in this sort of feverish, slightly slightly wild manner. You seem pretty sure of him, said he. And for your sake, I hope you may be right. If it came to trial, your name might appear. A warning there from Utterson about reputation. Your reputation would be in absolute tatters. It would be ruined if it was associated with the murder of Danvers Carew. So, like, you know, he, he's, it's a warning there from, from Utterson. I am quite sure of him, replied Jekyll. I have grounds for certainty that I cannot share with anyone. So, big secret there. He can't t- even tell Utterson um, the, this, how, why he's so certain that Jekyll won't cause any more harm and we won't see him anymore. But there is one thing on which you may advise me. I have I have received the letter. Note that pause there. He's a bit, it shows that he's in a distressed state of mind. And I'm at a loss whether I should show it to the police. So he's got something. He's not sure about showing it to police, this letter. 
Um, so yeah, just underline the letter. Just remember that. I should like to leave it in your hands, Utterson. You would judge wisely, I am sure. I have so great a trust in you. So again, like, you know, if you think about Utterson, he's someone who can judge wisely. And there's this idea of trust again. I have so, I have so great a trust in you. Utterson equals trustworthy, reliable. Actually, unlike uh, Jekyll, perhaps. You fear, I suppose, that it might lead to his detection, asked the lawyer. No, said the other. I cannot say that I care what becomes of Hyde. I am quite done with him. We get that repeat, repetition again. He keeps saying, I'm done with him. Um, it almost sounds like, um, it almost sounds like, like an addict giving up a drug, you know. I am done with him. And that's why sometimes I think people think this could be a love affair. You know, that, 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 and that's what Artisan's worried about. Like, oh, is Jack, are Jekyll and Hyde gay? Is that why he's kind of so ashamed of what he's been doing? You know, it's Victorian England being gay. Not, it's not very accept, seen as socially acceptable. And he's saying, I'm done with him. I was thinking of my own character, which this hateful business has rather exposed. Artisan ruminated a while. Ruminated just means like thinks, you know, thinking, you're ruminating. He was surprised at his friend's selfishness and yet relieved by it. So he's surprised at his friend's selfishness. So he's, surprised, he's surprised that he wants to, um, you know, he's thinking of himself rather than just hide. But he's relieved by it. And let's think about why might he be relieved, Utterson. Well, you know, um, Jekyll is distancing himself from Hyde and like the shame of it. And if you think about as well, about, about you know, if Utterson thinks they're gay, well, he might be thinking, okay, well, maybe the relationship's over. If he's thinking that, um, you know, Hyde is the monstrous person who could ruin Jekyll's reputation, and by association, by association, perhaps, Utterson's reputation, he's just relieved that Jekyll's getting out of this nonsense, this kind of strange behaviour. Well, said he, at last, let me see the letter. The letter was written in an odd, upright hand. So this is odd, yeah, strange, and signed Edward Hyde. And it signified, briefly enough, that the writer's benefactor, Dr. Jekyll, whom he had so long so unworthily repaid for a thousand generosities, need labour under no alarm for his safety, as he had means of escape on which he had placed a sure dependence. The lawyer liked this letter well enough. It put a better colour on the intimacy than he had looked for. And he blamed himself for some of his past suspicions. So definitely there, definitely there we've got that idea perhaps that, that Artisan thought that, that Jekyll and Hyde were gay. Because he says here, it, it put a better colour on the intimacy that he had looked for. Okay, so, oh, all right, so they, it was just as kind of like, he helped, you know, Jekyll was just helping him out as, as a kind of friend, as, a, as like a father figure, not in this kind of relationship. And he blamed himself for some of his past suspicions. Well, he might have suspected that there was some kind of romantic relationship going on between Jekyll and Hyde. And it was, kind of, as I've said before, you know, being homosexual was illegal uh, in Victorian times. And maybe Utterson is like, feels ashamed really that actually he, he, he'd got the wrong end of the stick about everything. But an interesting thing as well, just to say that, that, that Jekyll had given Hyde a thousand generosities. It is a bit odd though, isn't it? That he's committed a murder and Jekyll's instinct is not to dob him into the police. It's to actually kind of help him get away with it in some ways, which is kind of odd from Jekyll's point of view. Um, Have you the envelope? He asked. I burned it, replied Jekyll. That's a bit odd. Why would he burn the envelope? So I'm going to put why, the little question. Before I thought what I was about, but it bore no postmark. The note was handed in. So he says, important plot point, the note was handed in, you know, by hand. Uh, that's how he got the letter. Shall I keep this and sleep upon it? Asked Utterson. I wish you to judge for me entirely, was the reply. I have lost confidence in myself. So Jekyll's lost confidence in, in himself, which is, uh, you know, again, very strange behaviour from Jekyll in this chapter, especially compared to the earlier one. Well, I shall consider return a lawyer. And now one word uh, more. It was Hyde who dictated the terms in your will about that disappearance. So now he's asking about the will again uh, to, to Jekyll. The doctor seems seized with a qualm of faintness. Good little quote there. He's seized with a kind of, he feels suddenly faint at the prospect of, of Utterson getting too close to the truth. He shut his mouth tight and nodded. Okay, so he said, so and it, you wonder there, 
the way he shuts his mouth, he doesn't actually speak. Is he lying? Is my question. He doesn't. He, he just nods and goes, "Yep, yeah, Usson, that's what happened." But is he lying? I knew it," said Utterson. "He meant to murder you. You've had a fine escape." So Utterson now is going to this idea that, "Oh, you were just scared, Jekyll. Um, he was going to kill you. That's why you're protecting him." I understand now. And Utterson again, just being really, really rational. He's constantly rational, trying to come up with like a logical uh, solution to everything, rather than a kind of supernatural one, which we might come to later. I have had what is far more to the purpose, returned the doctor solemnly. He say uh, solemnly, good ad- adverb again there. He's really solemn. I've had a lesson. Oh God, Utterson, what a lesson I have had. So again, we get a, a, a kind of a hint of what's happened to him. And again, oh God, an exclamation to God. What a lesson I have had. He sort of repeats it. That he's ha- he's learned something kind of terrible and life, almost like life changing. Um, and he covered his face for a moment with his hands. Again, I think really important in Stevenson's writing is the way people move. And here, you know, covering his face um, with his hands, he's like hiding. He's kind of, he's kind of, uh, sh- he feels like shameful. On his way out, the lawyer stopped and had a word or two with Paul. By the by, said he, there was a letter handed in today. What was the message like? But Paul was positive nothing had come except by post, and only circulars by that, he added. So, Utterson, being a bit like a detective there, he's checking whether Jekyll was telling the truth about the letter being delivered by hand. As Paul, and we kind of trust Paul here. Why would Paul lie? Paul says, no, nothing came by post. So, um, Jekyll was lying, okay, and Utterson's caught him out in that lie. The news sent off the visitor with his fears renewed. So the fact that Jekyll's lied to him renews the fears in Utterson. Plainly, the letter had come by the laboratory door. Possibly, indeed, it had been written in the cabinet. So it had actually been written in Jekyll's house, which worries uh, Utterson. And if that was so, it must be differently judged and handled with the more caution. So, um, so Utterson is kind of fearful again. Uh, the newsboys, as he went, were crying themselves hoarse along the footways. Special edition, shocking murder of an MP. Now, remember, Danvers' career was actually uh, an M- a member of Parliament. So, so it's really like big, big news that this, this famous figure has been murdered. And that's why kind of, I think a good point to make, society is kind of like shocked by this. That was the funeral oration of one friend and client. He could not help a certain apprehension lest the good name of another should be sucked down in the eddy of the scandal. An eddy is like a whirl that you get in like a, rith- in a, in like a river. And he's worried, isn't he, that perhaps that uh, Jekyll too will be pulled down into this scandal. Good word there. You know, they're all worried about scandal. It was at least a ticklish decision that he had to make. And self-reliant as he was by habit, he began to cherish a longing for advice. So there's no one to really advise uh, uh, um, Utterson at this point, although he's going to think of someone in a second. It was not to be had directly, but perhaps he thought it might be fished for. Presently after, he sat on one side of his own hearth with Mr. Guest. So we're going to meet a new character here. He's a one chapter wonder. His head clerk, so he works for um, in kind of legal affairs for Utterson upon the other. And midway between, at a nicely calculated distance from the fire, a bottle of a particular old wine that had long dwelt unsunned in the foundations of his house. So there's a really like old wine um, sitting there. The fog still slept on the wing above the drowned city. That's a lovely line for setting. The fog is sleeping, it's personified. And the city is drowning. Think of that metaphor there. Um, I hope you can see that personified. Um, and the city is drowning. Lovely sort of image of London drowning in this mystery. Where the lamps glimmered like carbuncles. And through the muffle and smother of these fallen clouds, the procession of the town's life was still rolling in through the great arteries with a sound as of a mighty wind. So it's like uh, these arteries, like London is almost, London is alive. Uh, and it's almost like uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's drowning, it's alive, uh, and actually there's like a procession of life rolling through it. But the room was gay with firelight, so actually the room they're in, quite happy, him and, and guest. 
In the bottle, the acids were long ago resolved. The imperial dye had softened with time, as the, colors, as the color grows richer in stained windows, and a glow of hot afternoons on hillside vineyards was ready to be set free. Let me just get that right. And disperse the fogs of London. Insensibly, the lawyer melted. There was no man from whom he kept fewer secrets than Mr. Guest. So he really, you know, Utterson trusts Mr. Guest. Yeah, so there's, there's a sense of trust there. And he was not always sure that he kept as many as he meant. Guest had often been on business to the doctors. He knew Paul. He could scarce have failed to hear of Mr. Hyde's familiarity about the house. He might draw conclusions. So he's a bit worried that actually maybe Guest will go to tell, um, uh, you know, the Hyde sort of a, a house, including Paul, about some of Utterson's suspicions. What is it, was it not as well then that he should see a letter which put that mystery to rights? And above all, since Guest, being a great student and critic of handwriting. So this is kind of his plot function, Guest. He's really, really good at kind of analysing handwriting. Uh, would consider the step natural and obliging. The clerk, besides, was a man of counsel. He would scarce read so strange a document without dropping a, mar a remark. And by that remark, Mr. Utterson might shape his future course. So he's going to look for advice from, um, from Guest. This is a sad business about Sir Danvers, he said. Yes, sir, indeed. It has elicited a great deal of public feeling. So again, society is shocked by that murder. It's like rocked by it. Returned guest. The man, of course, was mad. Okay, so instantly he's saying like like Hyde, or you know, he doesn't know it was Hyde, but the murderer must be mad. I should like to hear your views on that, replied Utterson. I have a document here in his handwriting. It is between ourselves, for I scarce know what to do about it. It is an ugly business at the best. So, you know, this whole business, because it's kind of scandalous and it's dealing with murder and suspicion, it's kind of ugly. So that word ugly, that quite interesting adjective. But there it is, quite in your way, a murderer's autograph. So, you know, uh, again, we had it earlier, didn't we? Satan's signature. And now we've got this murderer's autograph to describe um, Hyde's uh, uh, handwriting, yeah? Guest's eyes brightened, and he sat down at once and studied it with passion. No, sir, he said, not mad. So he doesn't agree with him, he doesn't think he's mad. He just thinks it's odd, but it is an odd hand. And by all accounts, a very odd writer, added the lawyer. Just then the servant entered with a note. So another note comes into the room, important plot point. Is that from Dr. Jekyll, sir, inquired the clerk. I thought I knew the writing. Anything private, Mr. Utterson? Only an invitation to dinner. Why? Do you want to see it? So um, Jekyll is inviting Utterson to dinner. One moment. I thank you, sir. And the clerk laid the two sheets of paper alongside and sedulously, that just means uh, carefully, okay, carefully compared their contents. Thank you, sir, he said at last, returning both. It is a very interesting autograph. There was a pause during which Mr. Utterson struggled with himself. Why did you compare them, guest? He inquired suddenly. So he, I think Utterson's figured out what, 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 what's happened, but you know, the suddenly, the adverb again, it tells us the urgency that he feels. Let me put the urgency there. Well, sir, returned the clerk, there's a rather singular resemblance. Now, we don't really use the word singular like this much anymore. It means unique. There's a unique resemblance. The two hands are in many points identical, only differently sloped. So the handwriting on Jekyll's letter and on Hyde's letter are pretty much the same. Key plot point. However, they're slightly different. Maybe one sloped to the right, one sloped to the left. A bit like a sort of mirror image, maybe. Rather quaint. Quaint just means strange, said Utterson. It is, as you say, rather quaint, returned Guest. I wouldn't speak of this note, you know, said the master. So again, we've got this kind of like, this idea of secrecy. Uh, and the idea that kind of um, we need to protect our reputations. So we can't be talking about scandal and, and what this could actually mean. Because obviously it could mean something very, very strange indeed. No, sir, said the clerk. I understand. But no sooner was Mr. Utterson alone that night than he locked the note into a safe where it reposed from that time forward. So he hides it in his safe. Again, another secret, keeps it secret. He doesn't want the world to see it. Repose just means sort of like where it stayed a while. What, he thought, 
Henry Jekyll forged for a murderer and his blood ran cold in his veins. So um, uh, Jekyll, he thinks, oh, Jekyll has kind of forged that letter. It's kind of, he's pretended to be Hyde when he wrote that letter. And he's somehow kind of like, is he covering for Hyde? And again, this is a really, um, he's trying to be rational. Now, there's another solution to why the handwriting's the same. And I'm not going to get into it today, but you might know why. But basically, is there a more supernatural reason? Okay, is there something more? That's what they're kind of. The, that's what Stevenson's asking us uh, as a reader. And also, by the way, here his blood ran cold in his veins. There's great fear in, in Utterson. And actually, what I think is lovely about this book as well is that Utterson, we we're told what he's thinking, but there's also a part of me that thinks maybe he doesn't even believe that, and maybe he even suspects that something else is going on, but he couldn't possibly be able to communicate it because he's not kind of capable of doing that because he's like a Victorian gentleman who's very much a product of his times. Anyway, uh, that I went through that, um, took a bit longer than I, I thought, but hopefully that's really helpful. Um, and that's the end of the chapter five annotation. Back to the one and only live Mr. Owen.